Welcome to Will Mega TV, where we focus on seeking the truth and we highlight the best in hip hop, relationships, religion, politics, law, you name it, we discuss it here. I would like to introduce to the audience our special guest today, out of Philadelphia, attorney Keir Bradford Gray. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Will. I'm excited about this conversation. Excited to be with you because you know you always bring it. So let's go. Well, if you would introduce yourself to the World Wide Web, of course, we here in Philadelphia know you very well. And throughout Pennsylvania, you've been making some waves. But for the rest of the world who may not know you, where you come from and what you do, let's have it. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Well, my name is Kira Bradford Gray, and I'm a young girl who was born and raised in Boston, Massachusetts, um, and uh, was able to leave Boston on an athletic scholarship in, uh, to go to Georgia. And in Georgia is where I first found my ability to say, hey, I've always dreamed of being an attorney. Now I'm surrounded uh, by people who actually, those dreams are realities, and now how do I navigate this to get there? And, you know, just really stepping out on a leap of faith because I didn't really have teachers uh, growing up that encouraged me to be a lawyer. I didn't have access to legal uh, minds, you know, through my parents' networks. But through being in a Black college and surrounded by certain excellence, I was able to get the confidence and the ability to become a lawyer. And I started my career in Philadelphia at the Defender Association of Philadelphia as a public defender I then left that role and went to the federal defender office in the state of Delaware. Nice and, question. Yeah. And I, I, I just want to put a quick pin in it. I want, to, want you to continue. You say you got an athletic scholarship in what sport and what school specifically did you attend? So I attended Albany State University in Albany, Georgia. And I originally went on a basketball and volleyball scholarship. Nice. Um, as time went on and I wanted to do other things, I asked my coach if I could keep one my scholarship by playing one sport. So I ended up staying on the volleyball scholarship uh, and wanted to pursue other things like pledging and all the college attributes that I never had a chance to get in, in touch with. So um, continue, you pledge yeah. what you pledge. I pledged Delta Sigma Theta 1994, oh. Delta Road chapter. So I'm, I'm you know, wonderful things that came about that, a lot of collateral benefits, Soror sisters, you know, networks all across the world that I'm so proud of. And I'm still proud of, to, uh, proud to be a part of that illustrious sorority of Delta Sigma Theta. Um, and before, I'm sure a little collateral damage came too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm just like, you know, I've been living the dream in my, in my uh, area uh, that I've never really understood the potential of who I could be. And, and then just looking at this journey, as you just allow me to go down memory lane for a quick moment, thinking back on how like clueless I was in terms of the potential that I could tap into because I didn't, I wasn't surrounded by that or encouraged. Um, and, not, and I had great parents. My mom was a parole officer and my dad was a laborer. He worked on the you know, Boston water and sewer. So he did those things and they were hard workers, but right. just didn't have access to, um, you know, the professionals that can help me follow a path, not until I got to a black college and thank God I got that athletic scholarship to get me out of Boston right. and into that environment, because I don't think I'd be where I am now if I wasn't. Now, interesting. So you, you, you leave Boston, you go to Georgia, why Philadelphia? Well, I went to law school in Ohio. Okay. And in Ohio, I met a few people from Philadelphia. And I'm going to tell you, something about Philadelphia in law always intrigued me, right? It, it was always the same. Everybody knows a Philadelphia lawyer. So I figured, you know, I want to start my career at the birthplace where independence was offered to some, we know. <laughs> um, and I've always thought that I would just stay in Philadelphia, learn how to be a great litigator and go back to Boston. But I met my husband here, and 23 years later, uh, here we are. And 20 years later, he and I are still, uh, you know, trying to build something that nice. we've always wanted. So I'm excited about what Philadelphia has been to me um, and, you know, so ready to give back to Philadelphia and any other area where I can lend my expertise. 
So you say <clears throat> you be joined the defender's office, correct? Yes. Uh, walk us through your professional matriculation from there. Thank you. So I joined the Defender Association of Philadelphia um, seeking to become a trial lawyer, a litigator. Uh, I knew I wanted to be in the courtroom. I knew I wanted to fight for justice. But I found something even more profound at that office, and that was some great mentors who really taught me about the role of law and society and how I could really be a big catalyst for understanding of both worlds, right? There's some judges and some prominent people in this legal field that don't understand the, the way society really is. They, they, they want it to be the society they perceive, but society is very, very um, complex in so many areas. So I found my passion and my love of being able to bridge these two worlds and, un, and, and develop an understanding for better outcomes for people. And from that, I wanted to take it onto the federal uh, you know, uh, stage. And so I looked at the opportunities in the federal defender world and I was yeah. able to become a federal defender in the state of Delaware, which nice. I had a tremendous uh, successful, uh, you know, it was a really successful time there, bringing meaningful justice to people who really had accepted the fact that people only deserve certain types of justice. I never accepted that and in my gut could not allow me to just sit back and let people get kind of misnarrated, mischaracterized and disposed of. Um, and so I had a record number of successes in uh, the federal op system in Delaware. And from that, Josh Shapiro, when he became county commissioner of Montgomery County, started looking for a new chief defender uh, okay. to run the Montgomery County Public Defender Office. And so you, go ahead, I'm sorry. So, so you, head, you head to Montgomery County Yes. Right, uh, on the border of Philadelphia. Yes. Hometown of Kobe Bryant. Uh, yeah, right. Exactly. Right? So <laughs> how, how long were you there? Man, well, can I just tell you, in the beginning, when I got the call from Josh Shapiro's transition team, I almost talked myself out of doing it because, of course, fear and just, you know, this doubt set in as to whether or not I could actually lead. I knew I had the passion right. and commitment to be a good lawyer. But I had never been a leader before in that capacity, and I just didn't know um, what that was going to look like. So, you know, typical of many people, and I'll say myself, go through this litany of, oh, my God, can I do it? Can I? Will people listen to me? I've always been in, I've never been an administrator. Stepping out on faith, I went and had interviews and interviewing with Josh really helped me understand what he was trying to create out there. And at least what he, what he told me was that he really wanted a more balanced system. And I was all for that. Okay. So I'd go out to Montgomery County. And you know what I you know what I've discovered, Will? That these systems are not as linear as people who had run them previously wanted us to believe. There's so much more outreach, so much more output that these systems can have if you take the time to fill gaps that the systems never could fill before. Mm -hmm. And I got out there and I got to the community and I started to share information in a real transparent way about things that they had always wanted to improve, but didn't know how. No one let them in. And together, myself and the community came up with really creative ways where lawyers and the community, just like in the civil rights movement, when right. lawyers and community team up to push and advance for better. And we created a structure and standards of practice in Montgomery County that were laid the foundation for future opportunities. Well, that's, I don't know if you know, that's where you and I first met. Yes, I you, remember. Yeah, you were hosting uh, a community meeting, uh, developing, working toward developing better relationships between the Black community in Montgomery County, the police, and attempting to uh, prevent, you know, police misconduct, conflict between young people, and uh, you were doing the, the work you, you just spoke of. Yeah. So you, you end up in Philadelphia. So again, my life works in this weird way. It's like an assignment, right? I don't look for these things. They just really do happen and come. I'm sitting at my desk, you know, just doing my work, plugging away. And I get a phone call anonymously saying, uh, the chief defender of Philadelphia, Ellen Greenlee, is retiring. We want you to put your, your, your information in now. Click. And I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> I've been in Mako for three years. We're right. doing, we're going well, things are going well, Philly. But then I said, wait a minute, this is where it all started. This, this is a, this office has a tremendous outreach. It represents over 50,000 people a year. You know how many lives that touches. Right. And I remember 
what I found in myself, when I had the ability to say, I got the green light, let's go. Right. I have the ability to say, hey, this is what I understand that these systems are not doing. Let's do this. I said to myself, I can't pass up this opportunity. As much fun as I had in Montgomery County, I couldn't pass up the ability to work at the level of where the Defender Association Philadelphia uh, reaches. And so I applied and I was told that I was the underdog, even though I was running an office right. and other people applying were not. <laughs> I was the, 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 the one that was, you know, uh, less likely to receive this, this role. But I'm glad I didn't listen to those outside voices and kept pushing. And so who ultimately, ultimately made the decision on who was hired? So there was a board of 30 members uh, in the Philadelphia Defender Association, and I needed to uh, get their approval. Uh, so 30 people well, didn't have to be unanimous, but yeah. 30 people you, you'd want it to be if you're going right. to be the chief. Uh, and I was selected by the board of, of directors for the Defender Association of Philadelphia because it is a nonprofit organization, which is different than Montgomery County, where the Defenders is a part of county government. Gotcha. Now, it the people on that board, are they all attorneys or is it a collection of people in, with different backgrounds? Who are That's they? a great question. So uh, for the most part, when I started, most of them were attorneys. Um, we mm -hmm. really wanted to push to have more community members on the board because there are things that attorneys can't see that community members do see. Right, right. And that collective wisdom would be good. So now I think they're starting to do more and getting more community folks on that board, I would like to see a lot more uh, because at the end of the day, the service is for the community and we need more input from that section. So you, you jump into the Philadelphia fire. Yeah. I mean, it, there is no secret. It is hot and heavy here in Philadelphia. Unfortunately, crime and violence is at an all time high. And you actually kind of step in during a time where there's some political upheaval about which way the district attorney's office should go or not go. Uh, the FOP is, you know, up in arms, no pun intended. What was that like? That was, for me, that was right where I needed to be. Okay. Um, as, as a person that just has a passion for fundamental fairness. That's all I swear. I don't even know where it comes from, but okay. it's in there. I know where the system has failed a lot of people and where a system has failed their promise to, to advance public safety. Because right. we have to re remember at the core of our systems, it's supposed to be the advancement of public safety. Right. But there were so many areas and so many things that our system did not do that most people didn't understand that were far more destructive than constructive. Right. And so the, the promise of public safety was being buried in a, a narrative that was being really touted as uh, the, the model for which we need to accept in order right. to be safe. And I think many people outside of the system who don't know the intricacies of the system accepted that and allowed things to happen to our community members that debilitated them more so than build them up. Now, Keir, <clears throat> you're no longer the head of the... the uh, Defense Association, um, but during your time there, you had to handle some pretty controversial and national cases. Uh, you had the Meek Mill case, yes, centered on uh, these long probation sentences and and. and mass protests and hip hop artists and activists and just everyday Philadelphian hard no citizen coming out in mass free meek, free meek, free meek. You had the Michael White, Sean Schellinger murder case yeah. of which you decided to defend yourself, yeah. which is pretty unusual, right? Uh, extremely. <laughs> Folks are like, whoa, she's going to take on this one of all cases? Right, right. Today we're here to talk about the case of 73-year-old Richard Jones, who is or who was murdered by some Philadelphia children. At least they're being charged with his murder. Before we talk about that, 
I wanted people to understand uh, the heaviness of the type of controversial cases you've dealt with in order to get your insight on the intricacies of a case like this. Yeah. Share with us just a few things about the Meek Mill case and how you navigated through that. And then definitely talk to us about this Michael White murder case. Yeah, well, thank you. So briefly, I wasn't Meek Mill's lawyer, but we were one of the lawyers that worked on the case in terms of understanding what probation is supposed to do and where it fails. Uh, and I think Meek Mill's case shined a light on the probation's failures that were hard to really narrate because, you know, most of the people on probation are people who have deemed to be have done something wrong. Right. So they're valueless in so many people's eyes and not worthy of standing up for when the system treats them very unfairly. And so Meek Mill, who is valuable in the communities uh, because of his stature and who he is, right. really allowed us to move in advance on an understanding of what was happening to the Maliks, you know, to the Kevins, to whomevers uh, that weren't the Meek Mills, that didn't have the opportunity to transcend beyond that unfair, unjust, and har overly harsh punishment that does not actually help communities, but it actually, it was more... Uh, a, a anger from judges who felt like you didn't do what I said, so I'm going to treat you harshly because the law allows me this tool to treat you however I feel like treating you uh, without just justification. And so that for me was a window so that we could talk about with data, statistics, not just emotion, but other things to educate people on what was happening. And we're still advancing uh, better practices and policies right. and legislation here in Philadelphia. The problem is, well, trying to get everybody on the same page because these are really complex issues right. that have large impacts. So that's, that's, that was where I jumped in with Meek Mill and I wanted to find real stories, real people who are being harmed far more by, by probation than being helped. Right. And that's not something you think about when you're thinking about people on probation. You think right. everybody should be moving in a progressive way. Okay. But there were so many areas where probation just doesn't have the, the thoughtful approach it's mechanical and people get really, really bogged down and not being able to move outside of their current condition. And so for me, I don't like seeing that. I don't like it when it happens to me, my family members or anyone. And this is something that I'm always going to raise awareness about is where the system fails uh, to, to fulfill that promise. Care, J just in, in, in fairness to, to balance of people's opinion, what about the folks who are out there saying, well, he knew he wasn't supposed to be out there riding motorcycles and yeah. smoking weed and what have you. Why couldn't he just follow the damn instructions of the judge and not place himself in this position to be brought back to court? So I want to make sure, and every time we talk about these issues, these are not either ors, right? Okay. Nate Mills should be responsible and accountable for not following the rules. Right. But a two to four year sentence for that is a little disproportionate from those things. There could have been far more creative approaches that would have harmed Meek Mill and taught him more valuable lessons than him going to jail and becoming a martyr. Um, going to jail for something that most people who actually detrimentally harm people don't get that type of sentence. Okay. So it's, it's the situation of proportionality. What inputs do we put in in terms of the outputs that we want? Meek Mill has so many things that you can debilitate in terms of whether or not he's to be a rule follower and to learn a lesson, individualized lesson. Uh, but what was happening is that we only have one hammer. So everything is a nail. Give me some examples of some of those things of Meek Mill. Had you been the judge, you would have sought to deb debilitate. Well, one, I would have I would have taxed his pockets, on this, you know, number one. I would have curtailed where he could work and perform uh, beyond that. And it would have been a constant understanding to him that each time he violated, it would have been a dollar sign attached to the types of fines that he was supposed to give. Remember, Meek Mill is not harming anyone. He didn't, he's not exhibiting right antisocial behaviors that's detrimental to society, he's just not following somebody's orders who told you what you're supposed to be doing and what you're not supposed to be doing. So that should come with a price tag that he could afford, but right. also that would have harmed him a little bit in terms of thinking, man, I had to pay this for that. Um, I also would have looked at his ability to go perform in anywhere he wanted to right. and really curtailed that. There's so many things that I could have examined that were important to Meek Bill 
that I could have dealt with him in such a way versus showing the world the in exposing the issue with a, a unfettered um, authority of judges in terms of what sentences they can wield for probation. Well, he did get a little piece of that. I remember he was like on house arrest and yeah, unable to go out and perform and uh, hang out with his celebrity girlfriend. And he was running all over Philadelphia, um, talking to youth, trying yeah. to get his image straight. Something tells me we're definitely going to have to have another interview because we just don't have enough time tonight on this night court segment let's talk about michael white yes what he did because remember there may be some people who know nothing about the michael white case summarize what the charges were and then walk us through it and tell us why you out of it's like 700 uh defense uh, <laughs> uh, uh attorneys there right yeah it was about there's about 500 staff and okay. 300 attorneys yes Okay, so you could have assigned this case to any one of those 300. And traditionally, the head hardly ever takes the case themselves. So the right. city was like, whoa, she's doing this case herself. Tell us why and tell us, give us an entree into what, we, what he was charged with, what happened, and, and what proceeded from there. Well, thank you. This case is a unique case. And I, I should say this, it didn't start out with me um, knowing that I was going to represent this young man. Okay. I remember when he was first arrested, I looked at the news and I just saw this face on the news in those in eyes that had innocence that I had seen before. I have a son, I have nephews, I have cousins. And for some reason, I looked at that boy's eyes and I said, whoa, there's something more to this story. I just, this, this boy doesn't have the evil, angry face that I am used to seeing mm. with kids who are committing uh, crimes where Michael White was charged with homicide, murder mm. of an individual in Rittenhouse Square. Do you and have so, to have an evil, angry face in order to commit homicide? No, but you can sometimes, certain people, when you're around these in these communities, you can see either someone has a blank look, someone has a warm look. You can tell okay. through their facial expressions how they're dealing with the situation around them, whether or not they're used to this, they've been there, they don't care, or whether or not they just have a, a pure fear or sadness. Look, my son, if he got in trouble, his eyes light up like a deer. Um, okay. He can't, you know, he can't hide those emotions because it's really working inside him. He's okay. not desensitized to it. And I saw that. And you, it takes people who know when you're around these communities, around these children, you can see the difference in terms of how they process things that happen to them and around them. Care what happened? What did he do? Yeah. So what, what was the scenario? Walk yeah. us through it. I have to tell I've you, this case. I've never heard about this case before. Tell us what happened. Yeah. So I have to say this as a disclaimer. This case has been picked up. Well, this documentary has been picked up by NBC Universal for a okay. three-part docu-series. So, um, now, is this the one uh, filmmaker Ty Gray Hill was a part of? T. Gray Hill, yes. He okay. is. He has uh, been able to score NBC Universal to pick this up because it's such a fascinating dynamic right, right. in terms of outward narrative and what really happened. So the outward narrative. Shout out to Winfield's own Ty Gray Hill. <laughs> <laughs> you said Winfield's. Yes, yes, exactly. yes. Uh, we got um, you know up our my neighborhood, my my hoods. You know, I got you. I got you. Up, so yeah, it's That's still all Philly, right? We're still in Philly, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Philly is a city of neighborhoods. It so, is. You know, it we're is. all Philly. When we leave Philly, when we come into Philly, you gotta claim your hood. So. Exactly. I'm from, my area. I'm from Uptown, right? I'm <laughs> all right. Um. You know, the, the news narrative was that Michael White, home from school from the summer, delivering chicken for Uber Eats to another, to an individual, rolls up in, in Rittenhouse Square on his bike, on his way to deliver uh, food, and comes into contact with some men who are celebrating, you know, winning a big right. real estate deal. Um, the Skellinger, Sean Skellinger is the developer that was celebrating. They had some drinks. There were some other th substances that were involved that they had in their system, um, namely cocaine. And there was kind of an unruly interaction between Sean Skellinger and the people in his car and other folks by which Michael White said something about the way that they were behaving. Was he and delivering the chicken to them or how no. did they cross paths? Yeah, they cross paths. He, he was delivering, he was on a food delivery to an, a, a residential neighborhood. And as he's on, on his foot, way- Was he in a car? 
On a bike. I'm sorry. Right. On the bike. He was on a bike delivering chicken for Uber Eats. That's what he was doing. He went to Popeye's, picked it up on his bike, ready to go deliver it to the, to the destination. So that he, that's how he got paid during the summer while he was home from school. Um, And coming in contact just randomly uh, these, this car with people in it who had been experiencing some intoxicants uh, that they had taken voluntarily and they were in a rowdy mood, put, honking at people on the streets, telling them to move out the way so they can get by. Uh, and then Sean gets out of the car to, to, I guess, physically confront another driver where Michael is watching this. And this is all happening right. within a matter of seconds, honestly. Right. I can't, I don't want you to think that this has been a long time. Right. Right? Right. Michael comes up to the corner, sees the car, sees what they're doing. Here's a racial epithet, which calls his attention to that car. Right sees Sean Skillinger get out of the vehicle to confront a driver who's in his way. Um, and that's when Michael says, you don't have to act like a tough guy, like, because he sees the way they're right, acting right. and he says something. Well, that caused Sean Skillinger to turn onto Michael, go up to him uh, within inches of his face and tell him he's going to beat the black off of him. Well, when Michael hears that. Uh-oh. Michael jumps off of his bike in a defensive posture because, you know, right. look, everyone's trying to analyze this young man's behaviors. And right. sometimes it's instinctual. If someone comes so close to your face, you don't have time to think. You react. He so may Michael, be a college student, but he's still Philadelphia born and raised. Right. I mean, even college student has instincts. I mean, you know, right. I mean, people have instincts, right? If some fear comes to you, you'd have instincts. So right. he jumps off the bike and pulls out a knife that he carries. Uh, mm-hmm. while, while doing these things. He's been robbed sometimes and pulls out this big knife that would, is meant to scare someone away and ward someone off. Right. And he pulls the knife out and puts his arm out and says, back up. As yeah. he's walking backwards, which indicates for many people that he does not want right. to engage. Um, he unexpectedly, Sean decides to tackle him. Uh, tackles him in a wrestling tack- wrestling move or, or uh, a, I would say, a uh, football move because Sean right. was a football player as well okay. as a wrestler. Okay. Bigger gentleman, I think probably 250 pounds to Mike's 170 pounds. Right. Um, you know, of course, twice Mike's age. He tackles Mike, picks him up and tries to body slam him on the concrete. With well, cocaine strength, pure cocaine dope strength. As well as not looking or, or realizing or assessing, this young man has a big knife in his hand. Right. Now, the fact that oh. Mike had that big knife in his hand, and you, there was a portion of this that was caught on videotape, okay. where Mike is being flung in the air by Sean Skillinger, and the knife is dangling in Mike's hand. He's not actually using it on this man as he is being held in the air. It's not until they... Go ahead. The video, is this a handheld cell phone, or is this security yeah. video... In, in Center City. Now, you know what's so crazy? None of the security videos caught any of this, but some woman who was standing in the alley wow. ended up catching a, a smidgen of this. It was really quick, kind of grainy, so it was really hard to see right. what you were right. actually looking at. Um, but I had an expert uh, slow the video down for me so I could really try to get the best view possible. Okay. And what I did see in this video, and I seem to be one of the only ones because I went to wow. Larry Krasner, and I said, what are we doing? What I saw is when Sean Skillinger tackled Mike and the way he did it, the inertia of, their, of his body strength made him fall. They tumbled on the ground. Mike was able to get his, hand, his, his foot down. Sean okay. flips over, bam, right onto the knife, killing him instantly. Wow. Okay. And, and um, was he found guilty, not guilty? What was the outcome? He was found I, I got to tell you why I started, why I got into this, why, why I tried the case. You know, originally this case was with my homicide unit and they were very well capable of doing it. Okay. Uh, Mike was able to get out on, on bail in this case because there were a lot of things that happened uh, that allowed him to have bail. I called the bail fund. They reached out. Mark Lamont Hill uh, then hired Mike to be, to work in a shop during the time that he was going through the pretrial process. Okay. I frequent Uncle Bobby's and I was frequenting that at that point. And I would watch this young man carefully as I you know, would see him in Uncle Bobby's just to get a feel for, are my instincts about him right? Is he okay. you know, a young man that really just needs help? So one day I decided to talk to him and say, hi, Michael. I don't think you know who I am. I'm Kier Bradford Gray. 
And he heard my name and he put his head down immediately. And I said, wait, wait a minute. So at this point, he doesn't know that you have his case. He doesn't know that I'm the that I'm the chief of the office of the office. He knows the lawyers who are assigned to his case, which wasn't me originally. Because okay. I, was All right. okay. I was running the office. Okay. So the lawyers assigned to his case, he knew that. And so I went up to him. And I just want to talk to him and say, how's it going? Because I've always been very fascinated about this case. And this is a few right. months into the case now. And he looked at me. He said, I don't think they believe me. Mm. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I just don't think people believe me. And I started to dig in and what's going on with the case. And some of the things that I was hearing wasn't what my instincts told me about this young man. And something just told me they needed someone who could see this young man to be a part of this case. Someone who has vast right. trial experience, someone who has experience with life experience with young right. kids. Um, and then when I heard him, I, I really befriended him and wanted to understand from his perspective, what right. were you going through? What were you experiencing? I just knew I had to be a part of the case and I knew I had to show and bring his story to light. And well, so- I recall, I recall the city being very racially divided around this case and there was also some some ageism oh, uh, yes. you know taking place a, a, around this case yes bring us home on on, on what you're going to say there he's he was i mean when we when i started to hear him and we started to put the case together everything came together and made sense in terms of his perspective his community was so at the forefront for me. I had a, a, a ability to tap into resources through community members who believe in this young man. And I don't think people realize that's the key to, to really this justice system, having everything at your disposal, including community members who can articulate information that the person going through this can't. Right. Um, that's how your lawyer gets a full picture, a panoramic view of what's really going on. But we also found other things about Sean Skellinger that really gave us an understanding of his aggression. And there were people in Florida that had known him for a lifetime that okay. talked about how violent he can get when he's either drinking or confronted. Wow. So in the end, guilty, not guilty? What's, yeah. what's going on? Like, obviously, Sean is, is, is dead. Yeah. Is and Michael in jail? Is, what's going on with Michael? What's, what was the status? What was the outcome? Yeah. So in the end, the jury found Michael not guilty of uh, wow. homicide. And it was, you know, I think at that point it was involuntary manslaughter because we had really talked and worked with the district attorney to be to okay. look at this uh, objectively. But right. he still went to trial on manslaughter. He was found not guilty. He was found guilty of a misdemeanor of tampering with evidence because as a kid, he just did something stupid and threw the knife on the roof because he was afraid. Okay. So they found him guilty of that. He had two years of probation. He walked that off. Okay. Uh, he's very productive. He has his own child now. Okay. So he has given life where he was looking at his life being taken away as right. well. And um, this has been such a, a, an, an amazing epiphany, not just for our justice system and our justice and practices, but how we look at youth, uh, their ability to, to rehabilitate. Okay. But then again, what's right, what's balanced, right? Because this other family of scavengers have lost their, their loved one. Yeah. And it, it feels yeah. unfair. But when you really think about, you know, certain things, Mike's life, Mike going to jail for life wouldn't bring Sean back. And the totalities of the circumstances really do require or did require this type of verdict. Which leads me to really why we're here. I, I had to talk to someone who knew, understood the criminal justice system, the law, our courts, uh, and how it impacts society and the community. Richard Jones out walking in Philadelphia, North Philadelphia, one, two o'clock in the morning, and he's attacked by five or six children, ages nine to 14. He ends up dead. What do you make of this? I mean, I make of this tragedy because look, no one wants to see anyone attacked in this way by anyone. I don't care if they're children, adults. And what I make of this is the realities of what our communities are, are, are dealing with. And, I, and I, I mean that with all sincerity. Okay. Sometimes we have to be able to process the outrage that we feel and understand what are we trying to get out of this? What is our end result desired for our children, for our adults, for our elderly? At the end of the day, if it's public safety, then we're going to have to be far more intentional 
about how we get there. And what we saw with kids is as young as 10 years old, who many people are looking at as monsters and not deserving of being looked at as youth. Um, yeah, I have some questions. I mean, did this, this, does this case feed into the Hillary Clinton narrative of calling African American super predators? I watched the video. Yeah. They're, they're taking this yellow, I mean, the, 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 the orange cone that, you know, you would normally see in the sh streets while construction is going on. It's about 30 pounds and they're just slamming on top of this elderly man. Yeah. I mean, let me tell you something. Who does that? What, what is that about? Right. That's the question. That's the question we always have to get to. What is that about? Nothing feeds into this narrative that our kids are super predators, but society itself. So if Hillary Clinton is going to label our kids super predators, they're going to be treated as such, and they're going to become that. I mean, think about it. We're not talking about an isolated issue. We're talking about generations of lack of investments in kids, lack of structure in kids, and really easily able to put them in systems and structures that treat them like super predators with what is our output in that? Have we gotten better as a society by going on this super predator narrative that says, hey, we need to treat kids when they do certain things like this? And what is our, what is our output from that input? To me, I'm seeing the generational consequence of those things that Hillary Clinton's put in motion and the crime bill put in motion. I but, saw it. But, but these kids weren't even alive when she said that. It, no. Are you telling me that because Hillary Clinton called African-American super predators, of which I don't agree with, these kids decided to leave the house and beat this man to death? Not at all. It's definitely not that myopic. What I'm saying is these kids, sometimes when societies have resources or societies have priorities or leaders have visions or lack thereof, they have to understand Take from when Clint, Hillary Clinton said they were super predators, right? right? Why are we just dealing from the standpoint they're super predators, they need to be treated like this, instead of these kids are engaged in some extremely violent and aggressive behaviors. Right. What has happened to them? What should we be investing in now so that our kids are not this angry, are not this reckless, are not this careless, are not this violating of people's abilities to walk the streets? We are never going to solve our problems here by working on the back end and saying, okay, now this ought to serve as a deterrent for any kid with a 10 year old and 11 year old brain that feels like they wanna engage in something. We know kids don't think this way. We should know that. And people in these systems who are supposed to be more thoughtful in their approach should understand that because the whole super predator aspect and the whole, what, what, what Hillary did, not for the kids, Hillary drove and made it okay for us to lock kids in solitary confinements, in adult prisons, messing with their psychology further. And when they got out, who were they? Are they these people? Who were these ki those kids? Were these kids locked in solitary confinement? I want to take a look at if there's like five kids. Right. I know um, police have been doing their, their homework, doing their job, parents, have turned some some children in. Yeah. I believe at least one, two, at least three have been have have turned themselves in, maybe four. Mm -hmm. And police have charged two of the four. There were at least five at the scene. Yeah. One young lady who hits the gentleman over the head. Uh, well, I can't say she hits him in the head because they blur it out but who at least definitely swings uh, this cone at him, tells a, another person to take her phone and record it. Yeah, think about that. Think about the callousness of what our kids are dealing with. So you're saying these kids lock themselves. You're not, I'm talking about the larger picture here, right? But I want, the, I want to come back to this specific case. Oh, I, I am, I am. Think okay, about okay. the kid's parents, right? right. As a 10 year old, I have 10, I have children. Right. And in no way, give it, look, none of our, our households aren't picture perfect at all. Our kids okay. do things that are ridiculous. Right. Um, but none of them ever felt the coldness in order to be able to do something like that. What has been going on? Who were their parents? I know the father is in jail now, right? Was he a child 
that the system just basically said you're a super predator, so you get treated like this. Because when which, they have which, offspring, which father, which father of which kid? Uh, I believe the 14 year old girl. They showed a okay. picture of him sticking his middle finger up on his social media site, like that was his profile picture. Okay. I mean, and this this is the gentleman. I think he's in jail for homicide. We're thinking about who oh. is influencing and in raising these kids. What are these kids getting? every day. I know when I had a, a moment where I yelled or, or didn't handle situation right with my right. children, I yelled at them before going to school, their whole day was horrible. And you have to understand, children take in all of these things and they react and mimic what they've been given. And I, I know that we don't want to accept that in situations where we're outraged, but that is the truth here. And that doesn't mean that the kids don't need to have some accountability on what they did. But the question is gonna become, what is proportional? What is the output that we wanna put in? And we gotta remember, certain types of punishment, people take differently. They Meaning yeah. the same input can give the different output to some, some people. So if we wanna punish these kids harshly, okay. are they gonna respond? Uh, if we put them in adult jail and, and, and uh, stick them in a solitary confinement area, right. are they gonna respond in the way we want them to when they get out? Well, I um, well, it seems like you've already taken a position on on what should happen here in this I didn't. case. No, I didn't. What, what I mean by that is I, I, I hear you being very empathetic about the conditions of what's going on in society and how it impacts Black kids, right? And, and us, and adults. And it's adult. not just kids. These kids okay. impacted my, this adult's life. But my question is, what makes your little ass get up at two o'clock in the morning Great and questions. go outside and do this. You know what I love? I want to know why we're, th this is what people are saying. Where were the parents? Absolutely. How did all these kids get outside at this hour? Absolutely. And of all things they could choose to do, how do they all get on the same page and decide to attack an elderly man? Even at the point when it began, not one kid said, yo, yo, chill, we, 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 we're going too far. Is What is the responsibility on the parents? What is the responsibility, uh, 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 where's the accountability on the parents, accountability on the children? I watched the interview of the young lady's mother. Oh, that was, I didn't like it. I didn't she, like it at all. She says, well, Every I, uh, I was asleep when she snuck out. I get it. I've snuck. I've, I've, I've snuck out. Yeah. Right. I've done it. I get that. When I was a kid, I snuck out. I get that. But then she says, but, uh, you know, she's a good girl. The, the family was all good until dad left. Point the finger at dad. Right. And then she said she was influenced by those bad kids. So, well, you said a lot of things I want to unpack. The questions you ask are the best because those are what we should be doing here. Asking mm -hmm. the questions. You don't have all the answers until you mm -hmm. start searching for those questions that leave you scratching your head. I think the last question you ask is the easiest to understand. How did all those kids get on the same page to do this? We know mom, I mean, we know kids flock in, in certain things. It takes a bold, brave kid at 11, 12, 13 years old to say to their friends who are engaged in something, hey, stop. And that's unfortunate that that's not the norm. That's an exception, not the norm. But the other two questions you asked, how did they get out? Why were no, you mean to tell me there's no police patrol in that area at all that sees a, a five young kids out there and not stop and say, who do you belong to? What are you doing? How long were they outside? Who else saw them? The only person that saw them was this, this, this older gentleman. I'm, I'm sorry, that doesn't fly with me because those areas, someone needs to be patrolling those areas for exactly these things. But, uh, don't the parents, aren't the parents supposed to be the first line of defense? Oh, What's yes. their responsibility? But think what, about what, it. Are our parents to... going to be charged for this? Can so, they be charged? There's no charge for parents to be, be being bad parents. People right? are saying the, only time, the parents need to be arrested. Is it, there's, there's no mechanism in our system for parents being bad parents, for parents mm -hmm. not being attentive when they're, they're sleeping and their kids sneak out, for parents not in, in instructing or instilling good morals. But there are systems that look into that, which is DHS. Should there be? Should there be? I know if, as an educator, I know if your kid uh, misses a certain amount of the, 
days of school, I have to report you. And yeah. that goes to the court and you, you'll show up in court. And if they keep missing school, they'll send your ass to jail. That's not true. Or um, fine you. That's not true. It's, it goes into dependency court. And you know, my husband's a judge in this court, so he, okay. he reviews these a lot. So, so parents what, can't go to jail for their children being uh, constantly truant at all? They go into child welfare systems and they try, okay. the, the DHS system now works with parents and kids as to why they are truant. There are, th to be honest with you, there are some parents that don't know their kids are truant. Their kid leaves, they think they're going to school and they don't go. Uh, so there's a lot of different scenarios in this. Now, once Has that ever been the case? Has that ever been the case? Am I antiquated? <laughs> uh, in terms of ever been the of, case of what? Of, of, of the parents of truant kids who, who were repetitive violators uh, being sent to jail. So there are, there are now things that trigger a neglect statute, right? An endangering okay. the welfare of a child statute. So if, if by DHS being in this home, has now seen that, wait a minute, these parents are endangering the welfare of the child by things that they're engaging in. Right. Now, that is a criminal charge okay. that can be brought because you are not only not perpetuating good morals, good behaviors, right. but you are damaging the kids based on what you are actually physically doing. Okay. That is a different analysis. But okay. if parents are just inattentive, um, they're just not you know, very good parents, that's going to be hard. You know how many people you have to lock up? Um, oh, listen, I know. <laughs> But I do think these are social conditions and issues that need to be addressed in a more uniform and targeted way. DHS has to go into this house now. And why have we heard from that? I mean, because people want to feel sec secure that you are now looking into this parent who says their child just snuck out. What mechanisms allow them to sneak out? How often do they do this? What makes you sleep so hard that you don't get, you know, my spidey in the, look, my kids, if they're not in this house, I don't know why I have a clock that ticks. I go and look, look around. If Where that is it? man had shot those children. I'm sorry? If that man had shot those children who were attacking him, something tells me he'd be in something. big trouble. I agree because, you know, we don't have a crystal ball, right? So what we would have looked at in the totality of circumstances is that these were kids who had no weapons, right? That's what we would have been talking about because this right. man wouldn't have been dead by a cone that many people probably wouldn't have thought about, well, that would be a deadly weapon, a cone, right? right? Um, so he would have been, the analyzation would have started from why did you use that much force? Right. Why didn't you use the force proportionate <laughs> to what was happening? Inquiries always start to talk to, to, to go from the, the situation versus starting to look at where are we going wrong? Where are those touchstones that we need to make sure that we have in place so that gaps aren't so wide and kids like this aren't falling through and okay. families aren't falling through these gaps and people are held accountable for being parents, right? You need to be a parent. You yeah, should not have to parent your kid. Now, I have talked to some other attorneys about this. Um, and there's, there's two things that are coming up. We're, we're talking about from both sides, right? But we, we began to talk about, well, what route does the attorneys of these children take? And one of the, 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 the uh, responses I got from uh, an attorney, he says, well, if that's my case. I'm arguing that they didn't die as a result of being hit by the cone. He died as a result of falling on the ground and hitting his head. I mean, look, those things would have to come from the autopsy that allows us to understand what exactly uh, caused the fatal uh, situation here. So that's a, that's a legal fact um, yeah. that one would have to examine. You can't just speculate that. You really okay. got to look at the information. But I'll tell you, if I was the attorney for those kids, one of the things I'd be doing first in terms of the social constructs is looking to decertify that kid as an adult and allowing them to be treated in the juvenile facility. Because the question is going to be, this kid, we know kids can't be, be sent to jail forever because the Supreme Court spoke and said kids right. can't get life in prison. So this kid will be coming back. Who do we want this kid to come back as? Do we want this kid to come back as more angry and more, more uh, hopeless? Do we want this kid to have better opportunities and be better in their okay. community? Well, you, you, you talked about 
de- being decertified, obviously because they've been charged um, as an adult. So. They've been charged with um, third degree murder. Yes. It's a difference. For us common folk, first degree murder, second degree murder, third degree murder, you know what we think? Murder. We think the person's dead. Dead, right. 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 So what's the difference? So these are legal issues in terms of the way people have constructed their their ability to effectuate the homicide, right? right. So first degree means you planned it out. You wanted to do this. This is just some lying in wait. You're ready for the opportunity and you know what you're going to do. Second degree generally involves more people who are intimately uh, connected and someone just has a snapping. Like, you know, the, the common textbook thing is a husband walks in on his wife in bed with another person and he snaps, right? Because he has all ability, no ability to emotionally control his in that moment. behavior in that moment. That's second degree. Third degree is generally when there's an altercation of some sort. And while your actions, you, you, you intend your actions, you may not have intended the consequence of the, the homicide re- resulting. But in the heat of that, whatever it was, that altercation, that, that whatever it was, you did something that caused another okay. person's death. Okay. Well, you, so you see those, did I explain those very yeah, No, I, I understand. I understand exactly. The, uh, the altercation piece threw up some antenna. Who initiated this altercation? If it's third degree murder and that altercation is, is part of the equation, then there obviously had to be some altercation. Yes. What if, if they're the people who initiate the altercation, well, that, that, well, does so that shift it? Of course. Or, or have, have, have the authorities combed through, they've combed through right. the details to determine That's what I'm saying. Sometimes we have a court of public opinion that doesn't take into consideration all the factors that we need to analyze in order to figure out what's the right course of action here. And so right now we only have snippets of information, just like with Michael White. The information that was being fed to the public were very snippet uh, oriented and weren't really indicative of all the details and facts that allowed us to understand what happened. I don't know what happened other than the video. I don't know what happened before the video. I don't know what information was there. But secondly, you can have an altercation with someone that doesn't rise to the level of physical of physical um, interaction, but it escalates. Right. And when it escalates, there are things that happen that that cause the the death of another that wasn't originally intended in the altercation. So I'm I'm putting on my educator's hat here, and I'm thinking that in the course of defending these young people who have to be students because of their age, the attorney is going to go back, both the prosecuting and defense attorneys will go back and look at their school records, right? Yeah. And so I know in terms of, so in my capacity as an educator, I make these decisions about these outcomes all day long. There's a student code of conduct, right? Absolutely. There's the state law and uh, there are mandatory uh, reporters, right? In terms of how we treat our youth and how they navigate through um, our school system. So a student could get a write up, Joe swung from the chandeliers and kicked the windows out, right? right. John and Jane had a fight. Sometimes they are on the teacher's last nerve. Right. But then I have to look, the first thing I have to look at for a student after reading the write-up is their status. And the first thing I look for is, does this child have an IEP? Because it it determines how I can move forward. Does and and is this behavior the manifestation of how they've been uh, analyzed by a school psychologist? Mm-hmm. Some of my students don't have the capacity to manage their emotions like other students, and a lot of times, are like uh, teachers, are like he should have got four days for that. And I'm like, yeah, however, there's some things called rules and laws that I have to abide by. Mm -hmm. What happens if we find that 
some of these people charged have these social emotional IEPs and they were triggered. And the behavior is a result of their psychological condition. Yeah. Would they walk free? Well, I don't know if they'll walk free. Look, there's still okay. a rehabilitational aspect to the juvenile justice system, right? Okay. Your actions did create something. And if your actions are a result of your psychological condition, that still has to be dealt with. Okay. Uh, in some way, right? So the juvenile justice system deals with, are they in need of, re one, did they commit an act that's deemed to be criminal? And okay. two, are they in need of treatment and rehabilitation? Now, one can say that, I mean, there's no um, insanity defense here, okay. you know, none. Uh, this is, that's a whole different scenario. If you were triggered based on something, you know, like the kids don't know, and just like adults don't know the eggshell skull rule, that you take people the way they are. But that doesn't mean the law doesn't act in accordance, but the, the I guess, I don't want to say the punishment, but the sentence or, you know, the, the, what, what happens to people have to take into account all of these things. Because the goal is to advance these kids beyond where they are today. And if we miss the mark in schools, to really say we need heavy, heavy services here because Johnny can't take when someone says, hey, be quiet, hey, stop right. talking. You know, those are indicators. And I would love for us to do a deeper dive like that. That's the type right. of analysis we need to be doing. Right. What's been happening in schools? Who are these kids? Do they show up? Do their parents show up? How, what's their grades like? What's their aptitude in, in class like? And we wanna know these things so we understand how to deal with the family unit and how to deal with the needs in the best way. And so we need to stop with the reactionary, right. you know, I, I, here's the quick solution. These right. are long-term things that I want to see in, in the cities that I am, in the communities that I'm in, that there's real investments into mm -hmm. acknowledging that there are problems that exist today that didn't exist in my age. And we have to be really thoughtful about where these, where these touch points are, that we need to do more in resourcing and, and really be just uh, an intricate village in that, that school community setting. Okay. I don't care how uh, uncooperative the parents are. If the parents are uncooperative, we trigger DHS to be involved. And if DHS is involved, now the parents have to do so many things to abide by certain periods of law or else they will be held in contempt. And contempt is a mechanism. It's not um, you know, something that's a, a, a separate charge, but it's a contempt charge. If I, as the judge and my husband, he knows this very well, if he tells you, mother, I need you to go to parenting classes and you okay. don't, you'll be held in contempt. Now a contempt sentence, can carry up to uh, one day short of six months, five months, 29 days. Right. And that is some of the things that could happen in terms of using that other mechanism when all other attempts have failed. Kira, I have to ask this question and then we're gonna kind of wrap this thing up. I have a few other um, ending questions I really wanna know from you. As a, as, as a sister, I know black women, you're beautiful, you're fashionable, You're you are the original archangel of the planet Earth. <laughs> well, thank did you. She, did she have to wear the bonnet during the interview? <laughs> you know what? I, I need to. I'm asking <laughs> myself, <laughs> what in the well, Mrs. Buttersworth is this? Let me tell you something. I want to tell you a quick story about this. I mean, that's what the people are saying. I'm just repeating no. what I've heard. You know what, though? These things send a message, right? These right. things send a message, your appearance, how you appear, how you show up, especially for something like this. Right. It really shows what people have, who has, who is around them, who is counseling them, mm. who they have as part of their village. But I'll tell you a quick story. I went okay. to a college. Uh, it was, I, I was in Harcum. I can't remember which college it was. And I spoke to young ladies about career mm. development and moving on. And there was a young lady that came into the class with a scarf on her head. And I said to her, young lady, if you can take the, remove your scarf because the way you show up shows your confidence level, shows that people will take you seriously. And right. I'm gonna tell you, when I asked her, dude, I didn't think that I was embarrassing her in front of the class. Right. It was obvious that she had a scarf on her head. Right. Well, she came, she, she left the classroom after I said that. Uh, and then she waited for me and she came up to me and she said, you know, you didn't have to do that. You don't understand that my hair, it takes a lot to get it to, to, to be the way I want it to be. And this is how, how I need to wrap it up. You may not have the same kind of hair that I have. And I said, I understand that. 
But there is, we, we as black women are always struggling with hair, right. always struggling with identity and being and making sure that we're, we're, we're showing up in a most, in a way that people will take us seriously. Okay. And I'm not saying you have to have a certain crown, but there is a certain ability to, to, to take yourself out of someone's trajectory if you're showing up with right. things that are beyond, that are within your control to show people that you are, you know, someone who is, is serious and, and, and things like that. And that it's unfortunate that we have to be dealing with this at this right. moment, but, but perception, that's perception is a strong part of reality. The first thing that came to my head when I saw her head was the man next to her. The public defender assigned to her was a white man. Yeah. And probably completely culturally out of touch with how black women and black people present themselves in order to be convincing. Right. He, in my opinion, did not properly prepare his client to go before television news. Her, her daughter is up for murder. Right. Probably the last thing she's thinking about is her aesthetics. She's like, I got to save my baby, right? Part of saving your baby is you're, you're in a public opinion presentation. position now. That's right. He failed her. You know what? I agree with you because I said the same thing when, we, when the Trayvon Martin case was going on. Okay. And the main witness, Rachel Gentile, was not properly, uh, she wasn't properly supported in this situation because okay. one of the things that we, they didn't understand culturally is how people talk, the vernacular they use, and how it's going to be perceived. And so many people, that's exactly, you, I mean, you're so spot on with this. Many people miss the mark of these nuances because they don't really get how we're going to show up and what, we, what that is going to mean or how to have a conversation about it and properly prepare you for what you're getting ready to go in front of. You should not stick a woman like that in front of a news camera without properly even vetting what she's going to say. Right. How are you going to show up in this moment when you're trying to convince the world that your kid should be looked at as a kid? If they don't like you, they're definitely not going to like her. If they right. don't have any empathy for you, they're not going to have any empathy for her. So these moments when you're going on a public platform, all of those superficial things, and I say superficial tongue in cheek because some, the, some of them have nothing to do with who the person is, but right. definitely how the person is perceived. All right. of those things matter. And I feel like Trayvon Martin's case was, was hung and lost on the words of Rachel Gentile, who couldn't express herself in a way that some jurors would have liked her to in order to find her credible enough to, to find uh, Trayvon's assailant guilty. Good so insight. these Good are insight. some issues that we have to deal with when we're talking about people who are culturally in positions to help. How do they, what is their learning, the learning and engagement that they have to have in okay. order to truly represent our communities? All right, some final questions. I'm hearing rumors, mayor, judge, even some statewide political aspirations. Any truth to any of these rumors? Uh, there is truth to the statewide political aspiration. Yes, there is. Okay. Um, I have aspiration and goals to, to run a statewide campaign. And um, I feel like right now I am the person that will be best suited for that role. And I'm going for it. And I know there's a lot of hesitation for people around the yeah. state talking about who can win, who can't. Right. I guess we won't see until it happens, huh? What are, are you care to share what position? Do we, are, uh, do we get a breaking news moment here? <laughs> I haven't formally announced and I have to be respectful of the people that are helping me okay. so that we can move forward in the way that we need to. Um, so that we can build this campaign team and come out strong. But I know I have a lot to offer in terms of understanding, uh, in terms of leadership. Okay. I, I definitely never back down from the tough fight. And this role that I'm looking at is that role and needs a person ex exactly with those characteristics. Well, when you decide to formally announce, I would like to be one of the first to interview you within a week of time of you announcing. Hopefully I can get that okay from you. You got it. And um, <laughs> thanks for coming on. Make sure you just subscribe to Will Mega TV on YouTube. We get great interviews from people like Attorney Care Bradford Gray. We appreciate your support. Have a great evening and good night.